Hi everyone, Peter Giannatos here with uh, I am Amon Hamilton, uh, who's just uh, off another victory here in uh, sh in Charlotte at the Norm Invitational. So congratulations, Amon, and uh, I'll let you sort of talk about your game to your fans and everything, and we'll be, you know, and uh, and then maybe I'll ask you a couple questions at the end. So just take it from here. All right. Um, yeah, I won yesterday, which which was a good start to the tournament. Um, always good to win the first game and. I find in these tournaments, you never want to get overly optimistic uh, when you put a couple wins together because everybody is equally capable. Um, so now, today, I'm actually playing two FIDE Masters um, from India, actually. So both of them are going to be uh, very tough, even though I think they might even be the two lowest rated people in my section. Um, I'm expecting uh, Nimzo from Gare Shankar, my opponent here. And I've been playing a couple different lines, uh, but I decided to with Queen C2 today. Um, not really because of anything my opponent played. In fact, I think he's not very theoretical at all. So uh, more so just for uh, comfort and uh, varying things up. He went for this D5 move, which I think is uh, very topical and maybe even one of the best moves apart from castling against uh, Queen C2. Because if White plays uh, this this A3 move, um, then we get Bishop C3, Queen C3, and castles. And this line has been just notoriously dull for quite a long time. Um, Kramnik has been playing this with black for some time and just making draws. So uh, I think everybody finds that line a bit dull. So I went for the uh, probably the most principled reply, which is uh, C takes D5. And after pawn takes, of course, there's a, a, another huge uh, main line with queen takes, uh, followed by queen F5. But um, my opponent played pawn takes and I guess I was uh, happy to see this because I knew that we would definitely get an imbalanced middle game and I guess with a rating differential like that, I'm just happy to, to play a middle game. So um, going forward here, c5, my opponent uh, immediately challenges the center and uh, there's a pretty big choice here, but I decided with uh, d takes c5 and of course d4 here is, is probably met by uh, just long castle and with some e3 and, and a knight of three, uh, I don't think I'm at, at risk of losing a piece or anything dangerous like that. So um, after c5, uh, it takes bishop e6, and this basically signaled to me, because there's a lot of dangerous, or at least uh, very crazy ways to play the position with g5, knight e4, queen a5. Um, it actually signaled to me that he was probably planning just slow, slow play, castles, knight d7, knight takes c5. Um, so I knew the game wouldn't be too crazy here. Of course, my c-pawn is just temporary and planning to to let that go. Um, my only choice came around here where I was just considering whether to play c6 so that he wouldn't have the c file. And black uh, certainly has no trouble in this position, but um, again, just a different structure to deal with. Hanging pawns are always a little nice to play against um, from white's perspective. So I was just had a choice here whether I was gonna give those hanging pawns or whether I'd just play bishop 2 and castle, um, which is what I went for. Um, playing against an isolated pawn here on d5. My opponent played rook takes. Of course, a huge alternative. It's knight takes on c5. And uh, I was probably planning to play the same move which I played in the game, which is queen b1. Now, I don't know the uh, validity of this move, but I, I had seen a game that went with queen b1. And of course, we have this idea of attacking the b7 pawn uh, after some exchanges. And although my c-pawn is weak, the b7 and d5 pawns are also weak. So uh, on top of that, I have the dark squares uh, under my control. So um, I was happy to, to go into that. And after rook takes c5, um, I essentially went for the same idea, um, because I wasn't sure whether rook c1, g5, bishop g3, knight e4 with c3 under a lot of fire here. Um, this may turn into a pawn sack, and I wasn't necessarily sure whether I... Uh, had to do that just yet. So I thought I'd commit to that a little bit later um, by going for queen b1, bishop c3, pawn c3. And now we have a nice imbalance uh, from my perspective. And I think my opponent had a very critical choice here to play queen b6 and sort of bail out because I have a lot of attractive options here, like starting with bishop f6. And if pawn takes, I can even consider just some move like this, keeping the queens on the board, yep. and something like knight d4, and I can imagine a queen arriving on h5 in the near future. And that's probably worth a pawn to me. Um, and if knight takes, 
then potentially a very pleasant endgame would arise after queen takes, pawn takes. And despite the fact that the C and A pawns may be traded for these double B pawns, even in the worst case, I like white's uh, control over the D4 square, but it's not even that clear that both of these pawns will get traded. So uh, I certainly liked my chances here. Nothing nothing special, but a tough variation to go for, I think, if you're black. You know, a couple, couple of double pawns on the F file and B file are not always attractive. So my opponent went for B6, which uh, certainly looks like a, a great solid move, but there's a lot that uh, remains to be seen because of uh, the move bishop a6, which will attack a rook when it comes to the c file. And I think my opponent severely underestimated that, uh, the power of that move. So if we go forward a little bit, knight on e4, uh, of course, rook c1, and now queen f6, and knight d4. And at this point, I was extremely happy because I, I knew that a move like rook c8, uh, increasing the pressure, would be met very strongly by bishop a6. And you can remove my... Uh, Bishop on g3 before playing rook c8 or even right now. Um, but even in a position where you play rook c7, there's always a move like knight b5. So there's no easy way to maintain this this uh, double rooks right. on the c file. Um, and for that reason, my opponent actually spent quite a lot of time here. Um, so got very low on time as well. And that partly contributed to some of the moves that he made uh, from this point on. But he went for knight e5. And uh, I spent not very much time here and, and decided that f4 was very critical, um, which, is, which is what I played. And um, after f4, I, I think there's a debate whether you uh, take my bishop on g3 off or not, but I was very open to the idea of um, keeping it on the board, something like bishop f4. Opposite color bishops usually provide a bit better chances when I'm attacking, and uh, I don't see, I think all my pieces are, are in optimal squares except my queen, which can very nicely be improved by queen a3 gaining time here and, and bringing it into some of these uh, weak squares. So uh, I was happy to, to play this position. So my opponent decided it was best to take this off, which I agreed with sort of in my calculation. But after it happened, I was, uh, I was maybe even close to just winning because knight c4, by the way, is it's actually forced here. Um, if you put the knight... Here, of course, we just trap the bishop. Um, and the same thing remains that if you put the knight on g6 or g4, I play f5 uh, regardless. And knight c6 um, also drops material. So an unfortunate situation where you have to play knight c4. And of course, I will take that off in a heartbeat. Um, now I'm just playing on the dark squares. And we revisit this move, queen a3, which I think is very, very strong. Queen d6, threatening f5. Also, this pawn uh, chain starts to fall. So. Um, a very nasty tactic that's also in the position is f takes g5, uh, excuse me, f takes g5 for white on the next move, followed by queen takes f8 and knight e6. So a lot to think about, and of course with time uh, ticking down, it, it's not a friendly position. So uh, he went for obvious counterplay on my c pawn, so I decided to take this, and I had just calculated the line that after queen b6, um, he couldn't take my pawn because of the move f5, and he's in a, a pin there from b6 to f6. So I figured if he couldn't take this pawn, uh, at the very least, I simply win the game with my a pawn. Uh, but he decided to go for this. Um, and of course, when you have more time, it's simply easier to calculate. Uh, rook e4 was the last try. And after knight b3, there's uh, no place for black to put his queen with tempo or, or anything like that. So after queen e5, I took. And actually, the game went on, but I mean, there's not much uh, more to say about this. And Right. I'm just up a piece in the final yeah. position. So, uh, yeah, I had you know, white in the first two games, so it's good to put a couple of Yeah, together. I guess you made made full use of that. And, um, yeah, so you're off to a 2-0 start. And there's been a lot of activity between uh, your, you know, the Chess Bros um, Twitter and the Charlotte Chess Center Twitter. And, like, so, um, so yeah, so anything to say to your fans watching? Uh, because you have so many yeah. uh, watching. So uh, just... Uh, We'll, we'll conclude this interview with maybe a couple, uh, you know, shout outs or something to your fans. For sure. Yeah. No, I, I know that no matter where I'm playing, uh, you know, no matter what the situation is, people are always following and uh, I can really feel uh, the support. Every time I, I go norm hunting, there's a lot of people who really want me to succeed and, and I can tell. So it means a lot. Everybody uh, out there supporting um, and watching. Hope you, uh, you guys continue to do so. And we're off to a good start here in Charlotte, boys.